Hi, I'm Peter Brusso for 101 Small Business Mastermind, and uh, one, one of us is uh, sick, so the other two are going to carry the day. Say good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. And, uh, oh, by the way, Frank, why don't you pull that down just a little bit? We want to sit, or sit up. We want to see a little, there you go. We want to see a little bit more of you. All righty. Um, okay. Uh, uh, hey, good good Misfits meeting this morning. Mis uh, give us 30 seconds on what you thought about our meeting today. Yeah, I liked it. We, there were four of us. Uh, one gentleman was uh, was out of town, and um, we're, we're starting, it's our third or fourth meeting, and we're starting to gel. We have four different backgrounds, and as I stated in this morning's meeting, you're the only one of the four of us who has actually done in, in the past what we're trying to do in the future. So we appreciate having your presence there. But um, it's all about how to differentiate yourself from the others in your industry so that your phone rings and not theirs. It's all about getting your phone to ring. When someone calls you, it's a different conversation than if you call them. Boy, isn't that true? And it's all about that. And... Uh, uh, and what we're using as uh, as one of the basics is um, the, this podcast that we talk about uh, on a weekly basis, but also a lot of the twin stories that I create. I've noticed um, a lot of trends and similarities, and I, you know, we talk about those as we talked about this morning. We talked a lot about um, Amber Blonde again, our topic from uh, from last, last week. week. Yeah, and uh, uh, anyway, and, and I. I mentioned a little bit, a little tease about what we're going to talk about today. So it was a good meeting. Yeah, no, I, I really like it. I like the the, the twin stuff uh, popping out all over the place, too. Of course, I'm a big fan of your twin stuff, so uh, that's all popping out. All right, let me uh, get my block started here. Uh, this is the time you take your cyanide capsule uh, because okay. I'm going to bore the heck out of you. Um, uh, and here we are. This is how I'm going to bore the heck out of you. Um, let me know when you can see that. Yeah, it's a little bit fuzzy, but I can see it's just that uh, yep. it hasn't cleared up. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm working for a slow, low, slow laptop. That's okay. I'll, oh, I'll there it is. There it is. Okay, I can see it now. Here. Yeah, zoom it up a little bit here. All right. Um, and why can't I see that? Oh, here it is. Okay, there. That's what I want to really look at right here. Um, Per last week, you know, we, we talked about the anatomy of a good flyer, and um, uh, it, it, it brought me a full circle back around that we've done these before, but it, since we had our year and a half hiatus, uh, I thought it might be good to ground us one more time, uh, just as an overall, not in any kind of depth about uh, websites and, and basically what has to go into them. And for those that want, I'll probably make this particular slide available on our podcast. But, you know, on a website, this is what it contains. Um, keywords are the soul of everything. And I have an interesting story to tell. Well, I must tell it now. I was doing some keyword research for a barbecue client. And believe it or not, Q dash barbecue or Q dash BBQ gets 60 searches a month. So does Q space. BBQ. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then his, his name is John. But when you say Q, you're saying the letter Q? The letter Q. Yeah. So letter Q. Wow. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. And so I, I'm looking to differentiate him, obviously. And he wanted his name, you know, John's Q Barbecue.com. Well, that's already taken. And I don't like the idea of a of apostrophe s in the middle of a name or even a plural name if i can help it so we got down to john q which is the uh, beginning of his last name q uh, bbq.com and that has no competition at all and it searched it was amazing so it goes back to my story that i think i know everything about keywords everybody does and we really don't know anything until we actually look at the data the data didn't lie so keywords basically uh, like one of the guys in, in today was buying uh, URLs. First mistake you could ever make. Don't buy a URL till you do keyword research and uh, and then find out if you can get a matched URL to send traffic to it. You know, why swim upstream, spawn, and die? 
That's what most people do. Mm -hmm. uh, there's eight places you, you use those keywords in a site, no more than a 2% uh, percent keyword density. And what that means, if you have 100 words on a page, you can only use your keyword uh, two times in that 100 words. If you go above that, you run the risk of getting um, – uh, uh, hammered by Google and delisted. Um, video is preferred these days, three line paragraphs, I call them reader bites these days, everything counter to everything we were taught in, in uh, high school and college about uh, paragraphs, so that's all out the window now. Uh, pictures always should have uh, captions, uh, and that's one of the places that, that Google really looks at the captions under pictures, and it makes some kind of sense because if somebody's gonna put a picture on their website, has to be pretty apropos with what they're doing, you know, what, what that's all about. So they look into those quite frequently. Frequently asked questions are great. And, and I won't uh, bore everybody, but these are all the different types of things that you've got to have um, uh, connected to your site. Now let me just back out a little bit here. Uh, so that's the heart of your website, but basically here's all the other stuff that has to go into a website. You, the, the, it's really, you build a website and do all this stuff, you're still not going to get any traffic. It's all this other stuff that you do outside the website that drives traffic to your website. From your YouTube channels, doing link wheels, to podcasting like we're doing here, article marketing, off-site blogs, Yelp reviews, Google reviews, Platinum by the way, 411 sites, those are informational sites, backlinks, and of course your social media plays such a big role these days and there's lots of turmoil on social media. Uh, I'll probably save that to next week's conversation. Wow, some really big stuff going on with uh, how social media isn't working. Uh, and but it isn't? Is not working and wow. it's not the revolution everybody said it was going to be. And somewhere it almost turns back to the standard of what we have been doing is going to produce more for you than your social media pushes. So interesting. Um, so in short, Frank, not to kill you off, uh, that's my, my, uh, my uh, look. See here. Oh, before I do that, let me just go back here. This is, this is what I'm going to start covering some of the stuff. And this is an, uh, a thing that I sell. Um, you know, what type of software you're going to use to create your, your websites and, and your podcasts. And, uh, and then I think this is one of the key critical things we'll talk about next week or competitive analysis. You don't even want any competition. Well, we don't know how to get around the competition unless we know what they're doing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But there you go, Frank. That's my, my put. Any questions on uh, this particular... Uh, overall slide that now isn't wanting to come up. There it is. Any any particular thing you want to talk about here? Yes. Okay, that's, go for that it. Surprise you? Yes, actually, it does. That surprises me too. Um, one statement you made: so social media media isn't what we think it is, and it's not as productive as we thought it was. I can't wait till next week. Okay. Because yeah. uh, everybody. Well, again, the art again, and again, you know, I, I, I love research, and I'm reading stuff, obviously months old and sometimes years old, and they all drive uh, the point that social media is the all, not the best way, the only, the only way. way, right? And it's now falling by the wayside, huge, big time. Well, then I, I look forward to next week's uh, talk about that. And it's very interesting because unlike most people, this particular podcast, we try to, to do our research and see the immediate trends of where things are going. So you get a chance to see what the curve in the road is ahead. It's not three miles ahead of you. It's right in front of you. We always try to bring that. That's good. Okay. Looking forward to it. Okay. Oh, gosh, darn it. Uh, I apologize for everybody uh, because I've been I've been um, uh, hustling to Frank's meeting and trying to get back and got stuck by the traffic and so I'm I'm not as prepared as I usually am. Uh, with that all being said, hey, love go. that sound, love that sound. It's the sound of twin this week in the news. People who are prominent in the news recently and what we can learn from them. This week's twin is about a gentleman, and I say that because you wouldn't know that by the name. This gentleman's name is Wambi Rose. Yes, you heard me correctly. Wambi, and that is not a nickname. 
It is his real name. Well, Frank, who is Wombi Rose? I am so glad you asked there, Mr. Karnak. Um, I've, I've, I've created seven, I call them tidbits, little sections of Wombi's life that, that will tell us a story about how we got to where he was to where he is today. First tidbit deals around uh, when Wombi went to college. Wombi went to school at the Webb Institute, which I had never heard of before. It's based in New York, and they're a naval architectural school. Okay, and it was while he was there that Wombi Rose and a gentleman named John Wise became the best of friends while training to become naval architects. And I mentioned John because he's part of the story. Well, after graduation, Wombi and John went their separate ways. John moved to New Orleans to build boats, ships, watercraft, obviously. He was doing what he was trained to do. Wombi did something different. Wombi says, I know a lot of stuff. I'm going to take a job as a consultant, which he did for a number of different companies. The longest stint was with a company called McKinsey Company. He was working using his training, but he knew that he wanted to be an entrepreneur and do something special. The problem was he had no idea what that something special was. So he, John building boats in New Orleans, Wambi traveling all over the world doing consulting, and they, they, they separated their ways. A few years later, Wambi goes to Harvard Business School, attends Harvard Business School. And who was he there? Who's there with him at the same time? John Wise. They both were at the same class in Harvard Business School. Well, while they're at, at Harvard Business School, John and Wambi and the class took a trip to Vietnam for uh, some social thing they were doing. And one, one evening, Wambi and John were walking through the streets of Ho Chi Minh City when they happened to run into these incredible handcrafted 3D pop-up paper cards. Let me repeat that again because that was pretty long. They happened to run into a street vendor who was selling these incredible handcrafted 3D pop-up paper cards and they both fell in love with them at first sight. Well, B Wambi and John were not only engineers, they were also naval architects, as I said, and both of them immediately recognized the possibilities. And Wambi remembers saying, we realized that we could engineer anything into a pop-up card. So having seen a few of these, and with our training, it was just, wow, what else can we make using these, these paper cards as, as a basis? Well, Wambi and John were blown away by these cards, but okay, maybe we're weirdos, and maybe they were. But what about other people who were not engineers? How would they react to these pop-up cards? So Wambi and John returned to Boston with some of these cards, and put them in the hands of family, friends, and strangers, and sat back and watched their reaction. More than just a greeting card, Love Pop cards are sure to capture you from the moment you open it. The intricate design emerges from a flat canvas, creating a stunning 3D scene. Greeting cards hold special meaning for many of us but the traditional card sometimes falls flat. Love Pop's art cards are inspired by the founder's design sensibility and their admiration for paper crafts. John and I fell in love with this beautiful style of pop-up card on a school trip to Vietnam. We're both ship designers by trade, and now we're using what we learned as engineers and shipbuilders to create these magical paper sculptures. Designing a ship, you take a complex 3D shape and you break it down into a set of 2D lines. That's exactly what we're doing here, just on a much smaller scale. We designed the cards with a lot of help from a small team of illustrators. Then each piece is laser cut and then hand assembled by craftsmen and women we met this past winter in Vietnam. The sculpture is then placed into the card by thread so that it pops when it's opened up. With the goal of building and strengthening relationships, Love Pop's whimsical designs are perfect for all occasions. 
birthdays, weddings, and you do not have to worry about them getting tossed aside once opened. With close attention to detail in both the precise cuts of paper and the threading of the 3D art, the result is simply spectacular. In fact, they would make excellent decor additions to your mantel or coffee table. The enticing sculptural beauty of one of these works of art begs to be displayed, not only to be admired for its aesthetic, but to remember the thoughtfulness of the one who gave it to you. Wambi and John became obsessed with the reaction. When they put them in the hands of family, friends, and strangers, when someone opened up the card and saw the paper 3D sculpture for the first time, real for the first time, it was a wow, just like John and Wambi had experienced in, in the streets of Ho Chi Minh City. Their instant popularity convinced Wambi and John they were onto something and that they should start a business. But with their own products, because Wambi says, I did not want to sell these cards. I wanted to create and sell my own personal version of what I could make with these cards. And here's a, and I love this statement that Wambi said, and I quote, you cannot build a brand on other people's designs. You, and that is, in fact, we talked about that this morning. You cannot build a brand on other people's designs. So a startup company called Love Pop was born to take on the greeting card industry. Well, wait, you, did you say That's the greeting big. card industry? Yeah, it's big. Yes, I did. Well, let me tell you about the greeting card industry. In America alone, the greeting card industry is a seven to eight billion dollar business. So they knew the demand was there. But in this market, two companies, Hallmark Cards and a company called American Greetings, are as large as Coca-Cola and Pepsi are to the soft drink industry. They own the market. Competition isn't just fierce. Hallmark Cards and American Greetings, they define the market. So as Boston Magazine reported, even knowing this, and as smart as they are, Wambi and John started a small startup in the city of Boston going all in on greeting cards. Are they nuts? Maybe so. Well, like so many successful, and I'm going to use the word cocky, entrepreneurs before them, Wambi and John were not looking to dominate this market. They wanted to completely shake it up and turn it on its head. And looking at the numbers, this didn't make any sense as a place you want to tackle it. Because for the last few years before they started, as they started Love Pop, the greeting card revenues had declined every year. In spite of digitalization from Hallmark and American Greetings, duking it out for domination in the paper and electronic greeting cards market. With all their reach and money, the Boston uh, Magazine said, Business Magazine said, with all their reach and money, if Hallmark Cards and American Greetings can't innovate and stay ahead of the digital trend, who the hell can? You guys have to be nuts to put all of your startup dreams there. Well, John and Wambi were engineers, as I said, and architects. So they did their careful analysis, as all engineers do, and I wish I had that talent. And after their analysis, they believed that the greeting card industry at that time was broken. And Wambi and John were going to fix it. How about being cocky, right? Decades ago, this is their analysis. Decades ago, sending and receiving paper greeting cards was meaningful. Now, although Americans send on average 25 to 30 cards per year, a lot of that's gotta be Christmas. Um, it has completely lost just about all of its elements of surprise and delight. E-cards are obviously more convenient. They suck the joy out of greeting cards. They're not unexpected. Oh yeah, here it is, you know. And you can tell how little effort the sender did in sending it to you. Tick, 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 and they're done, right? Often, these e-cards are simply lost in the clutter of our inboxes. Oh yeah, I could open up that up someday. On paper or even email, today's greeting cards are mass-produced, 
impersonal, and downright cheesy. While originally trained as naval architects and marine engineers at Webb Institute, Wambi and John were inspired by the incredible artistic and intricate handmade cars they saw in their trip to Vietnam. A born entrepreneur, this is Wambi, he immediately went to work using his skill set to bring the joyous experience of receiving greeting cards again, like it was back decades ago to the United States. He said, I fell in love with this ancient art that the, the street vendor had in Vietnam, and I'm an engineer by training, so the design aspect of me going in and creating something special just got him all excited. He says, this new company, which they called Love Pop, is a customer-driven brand. They sold direct to consumer, and they spend a lot of time talking to their customers and watching their reactions when people open up their Love Pop cards, showed how special it was. Well, they're not just making a different type of card, though. They are offering a new kind of experience. Sound like John Taffer? Mm -hmm. Sounds like it to me. In his engineering style ana uh, of analysis of the greeting card industry, and, and you think about it, this is brilliant. Wambi identified the three elements that make greeting cards truly special. Greeting cards are personal. They're tangible if they're, if they're paper cards. And they're unexpected. Oh, I got a card. But go to, looking at digital cards, they're not personal because they send with a click of the mouse. You can't hold them in your hand, and they're not unexpected. Traditional paper cards, yeah, they're tangible, but they lack the element of surprise and personalization. That one saying, the greeting card industry had become stale. The greeting card industry is ripe for disruption, Wambi and John saying. Enter Love Pop Cards. Earlier this season, Wambi Rose and John Wise made a deal with Kevin O'Leary for their pop-up greeting card company, Love Pop. I have a lot of businesses that are involved around marriage and engagement, and I have so many customers that would buy this. Let's see what they're up to now. When we pitched on Shark Tank, we had $300,000 in sales after a year and a half in business. In the last two months, we've done a million dollars in sales. There are a lot of directions we can go with Love Pop, and we really looked to Kevin to help us pick where we should focus our energy. Gentlemen. Hey, hey, Kevin. From the moment I saw them, I knew Love Pop would be a success, and I was right. These guys are killing it. We've hit a million bucks right out of the game. The plan is to hit five to eight million this year. In order for that to happen, number one, selling online direct to our customers. Number two, selling big box retailers, and now being part of the Something Wonderful platform, getting into the wedding business. I invested in Love Pop because they fit on my Something Wonderful platform, the platform that supports the wedding industry and all the special moments in people's lives. These Love Pop cards are perfect for that. So Kevin, this is how we use your investment. Yeah, that is really cool. Shark Tank put us on a national stage, and now it's up to us to do something really special with it. I love it when money just grows on trees. Our mission has always been to encourage people to tell their loved ones that they really do care. Thanks to the millions of Shark Tank viewers and Kevin's strategic advice, we're able to spread that message to everyone. Love Pop, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wambi and John launched Love Pop Cards out of Harvard Innovation Lab. I mentioned they were Harvard Business School. In 2014, and I got this quote from the Love Pop website, and it puts everything in one sentence. When that one message fits all card from the drugstore isn't right, and a text isn't enough, do something unexpected. Send a Love Pop card. But a Love Pop is more than a card. This intricate 3D paper sculpture designed by engineers on cutting edge software and is handcrafted in the Asian art form of kirigami, slice form kirigami, something they developed. They developed this a technology called slice gamido to create elaborate paper sculptures they use in their 3D cards. And here's the formula. Two ship building degrees plus a little inspiration plus creativity plus a prototype machine called Rhino plus a laser printer equals love pop cards. 
How are you going to compete with that? These two, I call them geniuses, brilliant young men, applied their ship building skills. And, and as Wabi said in one interview, he says, when you design an architectural ship, it's a 3D monstrosity. Everything's got to be brought down to a, a, a 2D uh, rendering of it. Okay. They took that skill to a miniature and created the love pop production process as engineers do. Engineers create processes. And here's a process they developed, which they've been able to duplicate over and over again. Number one, you design the 3D sculpture. Okay. They're good at that. Number two, you enter the design into a, this hardware called Rhino, so I'll call Rhino. You create a prototype. Number three. Number four, you feed that prototype into a laser machine that laser cuts the 3D car sculptures. And then you take all these pieces and you have them hand sewn and woven together to create a card. For Wambi, the move from naval architect to greeting card entrepreneur has the feel of his destiny. His father was an entrepreneur who lived by this attitude. Wambi, you have to make something happen. Don't wait for it. You make it happen. And Wambi says that philosophy was ingrained in him at an early age. So even though Wambi is trained as a naval engineer and naval architect, Wambi is excited to devote his engineering skills to Love Pops custom designed and engineered 3D cards. And they were able to do, and in a year, they were able to generate $300,000 worth of sales. Not How bad. $300,000. $300,000. Selling them in little kiosks and going to trades, that kind of thing. Where people are, they would open up the car and so forth. Now, here's Wambi's brilliance again. He said, it was now time to springboard Love Pop to the next level and beyond. It was time for Wambi and John to take on a partner. I got to close something, okay. Where do you go to find such a partner? This is going to sound familiar to you. You go and apply to Shark Tank. After one year in the business, and after having achieved $300,000 in sales, Love Pop on December 11, 2015, appeared on Shark Tank. Wambi wrote a, a little excerpt of, of how his appearance went on, um, on Shark Tank at, in a, an article that I read. He says three things shocked him about Shark Tank. Shocked him about Shark Tank. Number one, it's exactly like it looks on TV. Wambi says, walking down that hallway, and we all know what that scene looks like, before the doors open and stepping into the tank was the, easily the most nervous he's ever been. He says that when you do walk into the tank, you really do come face to face with the shark tanks, the actual sharks for the first time, just like on TV. Number two, and I didn't know this, up until the time you walk into the tank, the sharks have never heard about you. This was his biggest surprise. Let's start over on number two, your audio blanked out. Okay, number two, and this was a bigger surprise, up until the time you walk into that, that tank area after doors open, the sharks have never heard of you. He figured the sharks would have received a file of, of about their businesses and about their history and everything else. He says, no, when you walk in, the sharks meet you for the very first time, know about you for the very, for very first time. They know nothing about your product, your idea, or your business plan until you tell them. They actually do make a decision based on due diligence after the show based entirely on what you say on that stage. And number three, the sharks are unpredictable. He says the sharks who understand your business right away are the ones who potentially might invest in you. And they were convinced because they were a consumer product that Lori Grenier would be the most interested because of her QVC stuff. And she's into, she, she was a consumer background. She was one of the first ones to go out. She went out right after Barbara. Then Cuban went out. The interest came down to two completely unexpected sharks, Robert Herchevec and Kevin O'Leary. Let me tell you what happened since that Shark Tank show. Kevin O'Leary invested $300,000 for 15% equity in Love Pop. 
that's that's what they got. And Kevin wanted to do one of those royalty deals, and then Wabi said, "No, nah, that ain't going to happen." So they negotiated. The next year in revenues, remember they did three hundred thousand dollars until they went to Shark Tank. The next year, which was twenty sixteen, their revenues went from three hundred thousand to seven million dollars. Whoa! That's a, talk that's, about growth. That's a twenty three percent, twenty four percent growth. No, 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 two hundred forty percent. No, whatever it is, it was huge. Oh man, no, it's bigger than that. Yeah, it's bigger than that. Not bad for a guy who was trained as a naval engineer architect and wound up selling greeting cards. I like that story, obviously. And, 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 and John, uh, again, I've, I've watched a number of his videos and read uh, as much as I could about him, uh, the time I had. Um, just a regular guy, nice, sounds like a regular guy. And John and John and Wambi is too, they're both together. But I go in and I, and I say, okay, what can, what can, I, what can I learn? about this, and as you know, it's all part of the book I'm putting together. And I come up with this, what I call the lessons from Wambi Rose. Wambi Rose is a superstar today because he does the things that most people don't. And I've got five examples from the story I just told you, okay? The first was the career decision. Wambi was trained as a naval architect and naval engineer. Most people, I, most people would say, whoa, man, I can do this for my, ho my whole career. I'm trained on it. I'm good at it. And I'm paid very, very well, even though it's not my passion. It's a job and I can do it. You know what? I'll find a hobby that'll satisfy my passion. Wabi says, no, nah, I don't think so. Wabi says, I can't imagine doing, doing this my whole career because it is not what I, what I want to spend my whole life going to Wambi says, I will constantly look for an opportunity to satisfy my passion, which he gets from his father. I want to be my own boss, and I want to make something special. Three questions for small business owners and entrepreneurs. Are you passionate about what you're doing for a living? Only you know the answer to that. If you could make a good living doing what you are passionate about, let me repeat that. If you could make a good living doing what you are passionate about, would you? And the obvious question is, what are you passionate about? Example number two, the opportunity decision. While in Vietnam, remember they were walking the streets and they saw that street vendor? Wambi discovered an exquisite, intricate, handmade pop-up 3D sculpture cards. Most people would say, Wow, these cards are really nice, but they move on. Some of the people say, whoa, these cards are nice, but I'm entrepreneurial. I'm going to see if I can get the distribution rights to these, to these cards, and I'm going to sell these cards as, in the, as is the United States. Okay, that's an opportunity. Wambi Rose said, no, I don't think so. He says, yeah, this is a unique business opportunity, but I'm going to sell my own creations, not theirs. I'm going to use their, their, their stuff that they do as the basis to create my own stuff and sell these in the United States. Why his own creations? Let me we quote what Wambi said earlier. You cannot build a brand based on other people's designs. Three entrepreneurial questions. Are you looking for opportunities to start a business or grow a business or grow your business? Are you willing to create your own version of whatever you find? And are you looking outside your industry? We talked about that this morning. Okay. Example number three, I call the industry decision. After returning to the United States, Wambi doing his engineering analysis, considered the greeting card industry, even knowing it was dominated by two giants, Hallmark Cards and American Greetings. Most people would just say, whoa, there's no way I'm not going to go into the greeting card industry because of Hallmark and greeting cards. They own the industry. It's stupid. Why the hell would you? How many people have failed with a lot more money than I have? No way. Wambi says, you know what? I'm going to go into this industry because, Hallmark, because of Hallmark cards and greetings. 
he felt that they had already invested a lot of money in digitization, you know, with e-cards and cards that play music and sounds. That, that was their investment. They were content with their status as a leaders. And Wambi believed that he could shake up the greeting card industry. Three questions for the entrepreneur. Are you not trying something or implementing something different in your business because of the competition? Is your something different, really different, or is it just a little bit better? Makes, there's a big difference in that. And if there was a lay, a, if there was a way to eliminate the competition, would you implement this something different? If yes, look at the next area. I call the category decision. After Wambi identified the complaints customers had about greeting cards, he decided to create a new category that nobody was in, in the greeting cards, that addressed these specific customer complaints. That's what Amber did with her uh, Rich Carlton stuff, as a matter of fact, last week. Most people would say, whoa, after I identify these complaints, I'm still not going to go in. Why not? Because with all their resources, if these complaints were that important, Hallmark cards and American greetings would have already solved them. No way. That's just a, a death trap. Wambi says, well, I believe the greeting card industry had become old and stale. The, because of that, the greeting card industry was starving for something new and exciting because there's been nothing new and exciting since the e-cards. And the three D sculptured cards that he was going to use to create his own were new and exciting. He created a new category that specifically solved customer complaints. Three questions for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Are you concerned about entering an industry or market that is dominated by major companies? Okay. Does what you offer specifically solve complaints customers have about that industry? And can you create a new category that specifically solves these customer complaints? That's what Wambi did. And finally, the last area is what I call the springboard decision. Wambi decided that he would need a new partner to take Love Pop to the next level. Most people would be reluctant to give up equity and thus rather than bring out a new partner and give up a piece of my, my, my baby, they would try to take their company to the next level by working harder, even if it took longer to grow their company. Wambi says, you know what? I want to dominate and shake up this industry quickly before Hallmark Cards and American Greetings marshal their vast resources to take me down. Is it worth giving up some equity to springboard and dominate this new category as soon as possible? Oh, it is worth, that is. It, it is worth. Three questions for the entrepreneur. Would you bring on a new partner to springboard your business? Would you bring on a new partner if they had the critical resources, key contacts, and much needed cash, which is what Kevin O'Leary had. Kevin O'Leary had a he called the, the wedding platform. He had all these companies. He said in people who were, who were doing weddings, he said, if you create the 3D sculpture, sculpture cards for wedding invitations, they'll pay anything to be so unique because their wedding is a once in a lifetime thing. The last question is, would you prefer 100% of a small number or a much greater than 10% of a number at least 10 times larger? That was Wambi's analysis. The one last thing I want to mention about Wambi Rose and, um, and well, really, really Wambi and John. Um, and if you think about it, we, uh, I, my wife likes cards. She doesn't like candy. She doesn't like flowers. She likes cards. So I spend time going to drugstores and buy cards. And, and I do pick out cards. And she, she's thrilled when she gets them. And it has a cute saying that I have my handwritten stuff on it. Um, and she, she saves them. But a day after the anniversary or her birthday, they're thrown away. What Wambi and John, John found with their 3D sculpture cards after the, the occasion, they're put on the mantle, they're put on, 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 on a counter, or they're put on a coffee table because they're just gorgeous. They're kept there forever. What about personalization? For $5, when you order your card online, because their cards are printed with no sayings at all, you will write whatever, no, to Peter, really enjoyed our meeting this morning, that, 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 whatever it is, and they will handwrite that card and, and post it and mail it for you for just $5 added, added extra. Wow. 
I then since I buy cards because my wife likes them, the cards are all spent anywhere from, from three to five, six, seven dollars. These love pop cards cost ten to thirteen dollars. Not bad. It's well worth it for that wow factor. And that's my story about Wambi Rose and love pop cards. It's your story and you're sticking to it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm going to bring us around to um, Good Twin, by the way. I, I, I really enjoy these things. I can't wait for the book. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I just, it's going to sit on the coffee table. I'm going to read it, read a chapter a day. It's going to be Good. wonderful. Um, you know, you talked about this morning complaints being opportunities. Mm -hmm. Well, and remember way in the past, we used to have the fractured business tales. Remember yes, those? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yes, and yes, I have a fractured did. business tale today. I love it. And now fractured business tales are, are things of what not to grow up to be like. Uh, or as you put it so elegantly this morning, a complaint is an opportunity. So my brother Ruben is here. We packed up all his stuff uh, from previous houses and moving it to Miami uh, for his move into Cuba. And um, in the past, I've called, you know, I've used moving companies in the past as an engineer. And, you know, you, they come out, they see what you got, they give you some quotes, and you pick the one you want, and they come out, and they can pack you, they do all this, and it's gone, and then they deliver it and unpack you. Pretty nice. That's, as I recall, the industry. Now, we're 20 miles out of town, roughly. We couldn't get anybody. Those would be the Mayflowers, those would be the Allied, those would be all the United. We couldn't get anybody to come out here to get us a quote. Now, preceding this is a bow wave. I, I told Ruben we had to have good boxes, so he went and got boxes at Lowe's, you know, packing boxes and good tape. We have the high-end tape that doesn't just come apart. And so it's well done. We need to know what's in each box, and we need to know the weight of each box, which we do. We have 30 some odd boxes. We have uh, three beds, uh, uh, a music box, a ju big jukebox kind of thing. We couldn't get anybody, not a single person to come out. And then finally, one of them said, well, we'll, we'll come out. Uh, what's your budget, your moving budget? Well, we don't know what it costs. Who knows, right? Uh, we just know we need to make this move. And um, they said, well, if your budget, you know, that's a move like this is eight to twenty thousand dollars, and uh, we don't want to waste our time coming out to talk to you. What? You don't want to waste your time to come get a quote or a bid, or give us a bid? No, we don't. They just assumed over the phone, uh, somehow or the other, that in fact this person uh, didn't have that kind of cash, which he does. So I got so upset when I heard that they had treated him that way that I, I started making calls. And I, I called um, a well-known company, and I asked to talk to a decision maker, a manager of some type. They wouldn't let me. They won't let you talk to anybody that makes decisions. Because I guarantee you, if you and I owned that moving company, that person that made that call and insulted my brother so, and won't come out and service us would be looking for a new job. Absolutely. Uh, and they should. And they're they're protecting that person, and they're not going to do it. They're, they're going to keep going the same way. Well, anyway, I I begged. I made phone call after phone call in the back east to this big moving company, and I finally got some person who took some some pity on me, and I got to another person who, in fact called the company here that I was working with to give me another call. Gee, I get to talk with the same person that insulted us and wouldn't come out in the first place. Gee, I'm really lucky. Mm -hmm. Gee, this is how not to run your business, Mr. Mayflower. Okay. Well, they finally came out. Nice guy, marketing guy. I even showed him the Your Marketing Sucks book. Uh, he saw everything, went away, and you know what his bid came out to be? What? Eight to eight thousand to twenty thousand dollars, just like they said over the phone, because that's all they want. What a coincidence! Isn't that funny how that Isn't worked? That amazing. 
I made coffee for him. We spent time with him, all this other stuff, and we got the same story. Sad. So you then shared this morning. Now, would you bring up your moving app? Yes, we were talking about getting ideas. That was one of our topics this morning. Um, that uh, it was a gentleman I saw on one of the sh business shows I watched in the morning. He was a mid, early to mid twenties gentleman from Brazil who spoke English. Even though I do speak Portuguese, I would have understood he spoke English, and he developed an app that um, that uh, matches trucking truckers either independent or trucking companies who have space in a truck can be matched with people like your brother Ruben who are looking for somebody to take their stuff from point A to point B. What's the name of that app? I don't know the name of the app, but I, 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 I forgot him, I, but, but I do know what he uses. Does this sound familiar? It's he based on the Uber app. Uber has people with cars who say, I'll need a ride. Say, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a ride. That type of thing. This yeah. guy said, did the same thing with truckers. He says, you're going to go from Salton Sea to Miami, okay? Or you're halfway, whatever it is. See if you know, it costs you, whatever it is, he takes a piece of the action. He says, maybe somebody's going to be willing to, if, if I've got half a truck full on a, on a run and the other half a truck is empty, I'm transporting air. If I could have somebody put a few boxes in that air, I'm going to collect money for the same trip. doesn't cost me any more in gas, maybe a little bit more because of weight. It's just a no-brainer. But I, I don't know. I, I forgot the name. It was a young uh, gentleman from Brazil. Uh, um, if I you would, say it, I'll, I'll, I'll remember it. But it's about, about a week ago I watched him on, on being interviewed on Stuart Varney, as a matter of fact. Stuart Varney. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I can start there. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not running across anything here. Uh, and he was the one. He, he was, this was his quote. It's going to sound familiar. Because Stuart says, well, how'd you get this idea? He says, well, I heard people complain. He says, every complaint is a business opportunity. Duh. <laughs> that, that, he's the one that, that said that for the first time. He yeah. Said, the, I'm, I'm, I'm all search uh, <clears throat> Stuart Varney yeah. um, and see if I can find that. Uh, yeah, the, the show's called Varney and Company. They're right, Varney and Company. Yeah. I've got Varney and Company yeah. on... on um, it was a trucking app. Yeah. And, um, anyway, and all he did was he took what was already there and modified it like we talked about. Well, like what Wambi Rose did with those 3D cards. Right. By the way, Wambi Rose just signed a deal with uh, Game of Thrones. He's now creating sculptures from Game of Thrones into green. Oh, my God. That's awesome. He's doing licensing agreements with, t with, uh, with TV, well, obviously TV shows, with movies. He's doing, like, again, Kevin O'Leary does licensing. Licensing right. agreements with baseball teams, licensing agreements with, with any kind of venue. He could do licensing agreements with Disneyland, and anybody. You know, you mentioned the, the talking cards, you know, the open them up. Yeah, and yeah, talk. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I had, um, I was working in the uh, wine industry. And, um, you know, here's, here's the problem. If you don't know wine, you walk into a store and here's, you know, uh, shelf after shelf of wine. How do you pick a good wine? How do you pick a wine? And you don't want to look like a doofus, right? I mean, there's a big problem there. Right. And, and I, I told this winery, I said, why don't you, um, well, be, because I'll go back to, I got a chance to interview a little boutique winery out of South Africa that actually rivaled Gallo in one year, okay, in sales. Uh, and so thinking out of the box, uh, I said, why don't you consider, and your wines, uh, and this, this is an Australian wine company that actually has bottles that tell stories that you can read. And each month is, an, is a continuing saga of that little story. And so their hope is to get people to, you know, drink their wine each week, each month, and see what the new rendition of, this, of, the, of the story is. Well, why don't you have a little button you push, and here's the vintner telling you about the bottle of wine you're looking at and why it's so special. Do you know... A person who knew nothing would be going down touching these bottles to learn and grab that bottle because they look so smart after that, right, and taking it to their date. Well, uh, in enter your misfits and entrepreneurs meeting. Well, we have a person in there who is a, is a handyman. Mm -hmm. uh, 
wouldn't it be clever to send a, a broken pipe with a push the button and learn about how you've got this problem going on in your house, you just don't know it yet. And you educate them. Each week, each month, you get another item like that with a little talking thing. Now with the mass production in the China, you should be able to find a boutique uh, group to do something like that. You know, but adding that out of the box touch and educating people in a clever and entertaining fashion should be a, a real turn on for somebody listening to this particular podcast about what you can do with your product. Bingo. What do you think of that? Being a very, very, very ingen ingenious, I don't know, not want to say ingenuous, that means different, something different. Very, very, very clever. There's another word for, I don't know what the word is. Out but of the box. Yes, yes. I mean, e even, even the other person in your group that has been designing her business card for a while, if you can get a business card you touch and, and it goes through what's in it for them to, to utilize their, their services, priceless. As a matter of fact, was, oh, I, I, I gave this, this trucking company guy my business card, and he's a marketing guy. And uh, I said, you know, what, what is the standard 101 uh, statement with a business card? Well, a business card, you know, and a lot of people don't, can't even answer that. You know, they, they design, they get these business cards. But what is a business card meant to do? What is the purpose? The purpose is to be memorable. Uh, that something on there, usually also leave it so that people will look at it. That By the way, there's a whole etiquette about when you take somebody's business card, what you're supposed to do with it. Um, but uh, business cards should be so memorable, so different, right? that you're never forgotten. And if you could make it so memorable that they has value, they'll never throw it away. Bingo. My card is a CD-ROM that actually works. And it's so different um, that people, I've actually had people grab this and say, go look at this guy's card, isn't this cool? And they're running around a networking event showing my card off to everybody there. You know, so, you know, maybe the crossing of you touch it and it talks is where it needs to go now. But, you know, you should be able to get those those little uh, touch things uh, done in mass. I'll have to do some research on it. But applying that to a business card could be priceless for people. Thinking out of the box. The world, again, I, I, like, I, I use the same one. The world is starving for something new and exciting. Oh. Isn't that so true? Something new and exciting. And different. And, 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 the old, and, and as we saw with, with Wambi in the greeting card industry, the older industry, the more starving they are. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised that Starbucks hasn't used this. You know, every cup of coffee has a story to tell. You push the button. I mean, I tell you, that'd be all over the place. There you, go. you know, somebody's got to do that kind of stuff. The, uh, the fusion of good ideas out of their industry, which is what you suggested today was to be thinking out of your industry for ideas that you could use inside your, your current industry. Well, after you finish had to drive back, you left the bureau. I remember we were talking to the handyman and we were talking about the end of our meeting, what you got out of it. And uh, I said, nobody knows more about handyman business than you do because you've been doing it for 30, 30 years, yeah. 30 years. I said, you're not going to get anything new there. Go outside your industry, industry like Amber did with the hotels industry to build her auto shops, what Wambi did, you know, to do his thing. Uh, go outside your industry, think about it, bring it into our group, let's toss it around, and then you decide. We'll give you, think it's great, we'll give you something that gets lousy. You get different views, and then you decide. The handyman industry is starving. You know, the latest, uh, to me, the you know, only advice they had is Angie's List and now Home Advisor. You can go online and check out reviews and bake. Okay, good. So I like yours. Are sending a piece of wood with a nail bent and then uh, that, 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 exactly right. Do something different. I like to quote Bonnie Raitt, and I and I only know one Bonnie Raitt song. I'm sure she's a very talented artist. She had one song that I still think about. She says, "Let's give them something to talk about." Oh, I love it. Yes. 
Let's give them something to talk to about. Talk about. Yep. Give them the fact that your card is blue and this is red. That's nice, but you're still a damn card. The, Yours uh, is not a damn card. Yours is that uh, CD. The, the joke I have with this too, if you don't like anything I have to say, it makes a great drink coaster. Bingo. Bingo. Yep. And uh, matter of fact, well, I don't know that I have one here. I have one out there. One I can grab quickly, but uh, oh yes, I do. Hang on here. Give me a second, everybody. Uh, when I was making clients discs, CD-ROMs, and whatnot, um, I and I'm burning a lot of DVDs and CD-ROMs. You always end up with throwaways, right? Well, I've already designed their label. Well, what if I did their label, made it a drink coaster, put it on a CD-ROM or a DVD that's used or old or blank, and put some feed on it from Home Depot, and lo and behold, they have something that they they can only get with me. Yeah. And you print, print a label, you know, that comes right off the printer, add the little feet, uh, put some uh, um, um, uh, um, waterproofing spray on it, and this this is 15 years old, and it's been used for 15 years. I mean, it, it looks like it's been used for 15 yeah. years, but fact of the matter is it's still holding up. But that's the kind of thing that, I mean, even if, and I should probably do this to my, my own card, I should probably put little feet on the back of my little card. It makes a great drink coaster, if nothing else. And it's already got a plastic case on it, so I don't need to spray it. I think I'm going to do that. Uh, that little added extra. And... Uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday about this uh, on the web. They said, oh, hold, hold the phone a second. And they lifted up my card. It's right by their computer. And I said, that's exactly what you want. They're not going to throw it away because it has some perceived value to it. But these other cards, gone. Matter of fact, I'll show you a card that should be gone. Uh, I had a, I have a friend on the web that uh, we exchange gifts back and forth. Um, uh, and uh, he's a First Earth Battalion kind of guy. And so he, he sends me his specialties, and I send him my specialties. Well, anyway, he says, have you ever had a tie-dye T-shirt? And I said, no, because I've been colorblind, and now I'm not colorblind. So what did he do? He went and got me three tie-dye T-shirts, and they threw in their, their business card. Now, it's really nice that they have a tie-dye business card, Mm -hmm. But you can't read it. Right. And it's oh, my God. It's not worth what it's printed on. And I went to their website, and it's, oh, you know, it's it's branded. Tie-dye is certainly branded. Uh, but this has gone way over the top to the point where it's unreadable, you know, unfortunately. Um, from Moscow, Idaho. No, no Putin involvement at all, I'm sure. So, but doing something different. Out of the box, look at your outside the industry and think differently. Get it entertaining, and people will love your marketing materials. You want your phone to ring. Right. That's the whole purpose of what we're doing. I agree. When a phone rings, it's a whole different conversation than you calling them. Well, you know, this weekend, I'm going to go get some feet, and I'm going to put <laughs> There you go. Motivation. And, and on our next, actually, I probably have some here uh, because I stopped printing out these labels, and so therefore I stopped printing out um, uh, making uh, making these drink coasters. But uh, you know, why not? All right. Anything else uh, there, that's Frank? That's it. That's it All there, right. Frank. Say say good night, Frank. Good night, Frank. All right.